tackles a mind-bogglingly large array of projects ranging from personalized immunotherapy to novel sequencing techniques to some very exciting work about molecular data storage, which we will hear about next. Welcome, Hanley. <clears throat> Can you hear me? So thank you for the opportunity to speak at this forum. This is not the typical audience I speak to, but I find it very exciting to be here. Um, I am not a computational scientist by any means, although I do know how to code. So I'm sure I'll make a series of errors, but hopefully I'll convince you that even talking to a genomic technologist such as myself might be worth some of your time. So the overview of my talk is really to talk about the impending data dilemma. Um, I think that we are increasingly seeing the implications of this and certainly being a hotbed of the major source of the problem is that uh, we are definitely confronting issues in terms of being able to manage this information that we're generating so liberally. Um, similarly, I think that there are lessons from, quote, cellular data encoding, namely considering how life itself and biology over the course of millions of years has provided us with potential solutions. And uh, namely, one of those solutions involves a format called DNA data storage. And uh, fortunately, I'm part of an incredible team headed by Saki and all his wonderful students and postdocs, and together we're piloting a project, and I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that. So uh, I was doing some research over the last couple of days. I've actually, this is up to date from a proposal we submitted last year. Um, these are just some quotes from a Nature article in 2016 where it was estimated there'll be 44 trillion gigabytes by 2020. So all these YouTube videos and other things, but in the era of big data, more is always considered better, and what that practically means is there's huge amounts of data that needs to be stored, managed, potentially analyzed. And so this represents, along this growth curve, a potential order of magnitude increase from what was noted in 2013. And interestingly, this article and the author pointed out that if you look at current capacity for developing memory chips, this clearly exceeds the supply that we could potentially generate based upon looking at microchip grade silicon. So it does represent a potential dilemma for maintaining our humanity's uh, uh, history. I like this as example just because it's visual. So if you think about the scale of data storage, one petabyte equivalent is uh, 20,000 Blu-ray DVDs. I know probably for most people in this audience in terms of the younger generation. You don't know what that is, but it looks like a disc, so I showed a pile of that. <coughs> 20,000 is quite a bit to manage. I've got about 70, and it's a big mess for me. Um, a one petabyte equivalent, actually, if you think about some of the hard drives, and oddly enough, my little group is up to nearly a petabyte level storage. is about 200 external hard drives with five terabytes rated to whatever you like or you're willing to be secure with. So, so a lot of stuff. And then uh, this was an interesting report that I came across from um, a white paper from these authors. And they talked about this zettabyte equivalent, which I had to look into a bit. So one zettabyte, as you can see, is equivalent to a trillion gigabytes. And if you're able to store the entire, quote, what they say is the global data sphere on DVDs, this would give you a stack of DVDs that could get you to the moon 23 times, not just once, or circle the Earth 222 times. So that's kind of like thin piece of plastic. There's a lot of data there. And so that's obviously going to be a pretty big problem. And I don't know about you, but 2025 doesn't seem like it's that far away, and I have children, and time goes by fast. More importantly, the dilemma of data storage life is kind of an immediate issue, and I remember talking to some of my librarian friends about this, is that, for example, if you think about our current standards with magnetic hard drives or even solid-state drives, the considered lifetime is in the order of decades, probably less than that, depending on how frequently they're spun. And in particular, if you think about the order of the problem, how are we going to go around transferring or copying zettabytes worth of data? And obviously, um, current technologies and bandwidth, that's certainly an issue. And for someone, and my group typically deals with large terabyte data sets because we're genome science people and, uh, and geneticists doing a lot of whole genome sequencing and other things, you know, even shooting a terabyte across the network, including Stanford's um, with its 10 gig, 10 gig lines, that's kind of a pain. So obviously this idea of trying to archive this at this scale is an enormous problem. And like global warming, it seems like people are kind of avoiding this issue. So life does present us with many types of solutions. And what you're looking here is a visual depiction of a series of cancer cells. 
Actually, I was going to mention this, but I am a medical oncologist, so please don't take that against me. But studying the course of cancer with all of their genomic complexity and all of the aberrations that are happening to it gives one an appreciation regarding the extent of data storage that any type of mammalian cell offers. Because if you think about it, an individual cell is a lot like a small computer server. It does a mind-boggling array of functions, has all kinds of levels of uh, regulatory control, and it truly is a computational system that's been engineered over millions of years for very high level of efficiency. Data flow in living cells abides by something that perhaps if you remember from your early biology days, something called the central dogma. Namely, you have DNA, um, the ascend fun fundamental genetic um, material that is encoded into a transient state called RNA that is encoded into something called proteins. All of these components have potential cellular functions, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's this protein coding part of it that's responsible for most of the functions that enable us to live, that enable our cells to function. And RNA represents an important transient point that's involved in maintaining very advanced levels of regulatory control. DNA is where everything is really stored. So if you look at the properties of each of these macromolecules, which one would be the best for data storage? Well, let's start backwards. So protein actually encode, is encoded by over 20 amino acids, depending on how you look at it. Can be highly modified chemically to do a variety of functions, but the intrinsic complexity of amino acids and the ability of these chemical moieties to create all kinds of different structures actually limits their utility. It's very hard, hard to write proteins in terms of what we call oligopeptides or strings of amino acids, which are the fundamental components. And it's hard to maintain them in a certain state where they can be reassessed over and over again. So proteins really aren't considered to be a serious format for molecular data storage. RNA can be written very efficiently, and we can do this quite easily. But the issue with RNA is because of a subtle base pair change in the chemical composition, RNA is extremely susceptible to very, very rapid degradation. So if I breathe on an RNA molecule, there are enzymes that are coming associated with my breath that originate from my body that will immediately degrade those molecules. So it's not a good format. Which brings you back to my favorite molecule, DNA, which I've been looking at since high school. DNA is extraordinarily stable. DNA can be retain its information through the course of decades, if not longer, and I'll show you an example. And much like what's happened within our manipulation of electrons in the, micro, in the area of um, advanced circuitry and whatnot, we can manipulate DNA with increasing finesse, increasing scale. So it's kind of been a natural point and topic to consider as far as new types of data storage technology. Here's kind of a nice thing. It's just sort of um, an example of a double helix DNA molecule, kind of uh, showing a depiction more similar to what we might think about in terms of, of, of more synthetic or uh, uh, arbitrary data storage. And here's an actual picture of a DNA molecule as it looks under a, a method of imaging called electron microscopy. So you can see that it's enormous. Uh, what you're really looking at is the individual molecules here, probably something from a, a type of bacterial virus called a phage. And you can actually interrogate it at this level, at the resolution of an individual molecule. This is incredibly small. So I'll give you some numbers about what this compression is like. DNA molecules exist as double-stranded moieties, meaning that there are two parts of the code that are exactly complementary to each other. And thus, you already have some level of duplication because the code exists in a two-part, two-strand molecular substrate. And that's actually part of the reason it's so stable. And so we know that there are at least four of the essential, four of the essential nucleotides that represent the bits of life. And the chemical moieties are referred here, including adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, or ATGC, as we oftentimes refer to. So DNA is the most ubiquitous universal form of data storage because there's tons of it right in this room here. And it has this biochemical code. And you can get gigabytes worth of data that can occur in very, very small compression within a series of microns that occur, two or three microns that occur in the small cells, perhaps smaller if you're dealing with viruses. So an enormous amount of density in terms of being able to encode information. So if you took a little bit of those initial physical estimates from what we talked about previously, if you had um, 
an external hard drive for one petabyte, and you thought about it being approximately one gig um, per given drive at the specs that I previously mentioned, that's about 200 kilograms total for a petabyte, or 440 pounds. However, in comparison, under ideal circumstances, or near ideal circumstances, one gram of DNA could hold 1.2 petabytes. And so you can imagine very highly compressed, very dense molecular formats in which huge amounts of information can be maintained. So is it stable? Well, this is a great story, and probably all of you have heard this through the general press, is that the woolly mammoth was sequenced. It came from a sample that was over 40,000 years. Um, and this certainly wasn't under ideal circumstances, but they were still able to interrogate enough of it to generate the entire genetic code of a woolly mammoth, um, a species that was extinct tens of thousands of years ago. <coughs> so what is really driving all of this has been something that I've been fortunate enough to see through the course of the last decade, I'm not that old, um, as a professor at Stanford, is this system called next generation DNA sequencing. This is a, a major technology topic in and of itself, and I'm not going to go into enormous detail, albeit let it be said that what we essentially do for these systems is sequence individual DNA molecules and derive that information. And because of the nature of sequencing individual DNA molecules, be it Illumina or so-called single molecule sequencers like the nanopore systems that we're seeing or using, you're deriving information from a single molecule, and that enables a huge density of being able to practically read the information there. So for my group, we look at genetic disorders and cancers to do this, generate terabytes from individual samples, even individual cells, and we can generate huge amounts of data very, very rapidly. And that's one reason that an academic group as such as myself is rapidly broaching a point where we'll need at least a petabyte storage just to stay active. More recently, um, there's been very exciting things that have happened within the sequencing technology space itself. And most practically, uh, there is now a number of sequencers that actually can sequence out an individual DNA molecule, much like I showed in that electron micrograph. And what's unusual about some of these systems, one in particular, is they're not even reliant upon standard chemistries to look at it. They're actually looking at the electrical properties of the molecule as they go through individually through specific pore structures. And so this has been an exciting area, and we've seen major advances. And what's happening, I think, over the next 15 years will astonish even more. So what does that data look like? Here's an example of, of the base code that you see. And typically, as noted by the previous speaker, you get the series of reads, and then you can process it however you want to. And so there's opportunities, and I think uh, the type of work that Saki and others here have done in terms of compressing this data is very exciting. Nevertheless, this is still data, right? So why is this type of approach even being seriously considered? And this is why. This represents the advances in total sequencing capacity up to the current. This is a little bit older article, about 2009. You probably can draw it up even further now based upon recent innovations and massive increases in mass capacity. For me to sequence my genome, I can do that in a day now. And if you told me that eight years ago when I was an assistant professor, I thought that would be crazy. But I've come to learn is that you never underestimate the capacity to generate and read genetic DNA sequence, because it's nearly always going up by two or three times every year. And so I'm at the point where I don't even care what someone says to me about the cost, because I figure in a year and a half, that cost will drop a significant fraction because of this curve. Similarly, this is where things are going, and this is the reason DNA data storage is becoming viable, is this massive drop in cost for us to be able to read these sequences, particularly using solid state systems now. So this is all electronic. This becomes practical at a point and an efficiency that we couldn't have imagined a decade ago. And so, for example, here's a whole genome. We sequenced this in about a day and a half. We analyzed it in about a couple. Um, it can go much faster. Uh, and this represents an individual cancer sample with all of its complexities. What you see is a circle, and each one of those circular bars represents a part of a chromosome, which are the fundamental volumes that make up a human genome. And where the cross occur, in either in red or in orange, represents errors, or what we call translocations, where different parts of the data have been brought together aberrantly. And this is what caused this cancer in the first place. So what are the advantages to DNA data? Well, you have this enormous molecular density, just as I described. 
I don't have to be lugging a couple hundred pounds of hard drives around or having one of my uh, information technologists, you know, upgrading our servers. Like, pff, I can handle that. My kids can handle that. Duration potentially of hundreds of thousands of years under lower ambient temperatures. We're not talking about sticking in, in liquid nitrogen. We're talking about sticking at maybe at 15 degrees Celsius. And with the right kind of conditions, that could be maintained for decades, centuries, potentially millennia. No electricity required for long-term storage. You just pack it away, stick it in your fridge, a petabyte or two. Rapid replication of data. Now, this is one of the most important points. I've been thinking a lot about this. We do face some major challenges in this technology arena, but I can practically replicate this data incredibly efficiently. So where doing petabytes of copying this information and placing another format is something that potentially can be done in a couple of hours. Uh, not so easy when you think about trying to do that at this level of scale using current solid-state hard drive or solid-state drive systems. Reading depends on well-established methods. We've known how to sequence DNA for many years. So if civilization collapses but we still have access to certain types of enzymes, we can sequence it. It's just going to be very slow. But if our technology reach and trajectory continues where it is, it, it's going, as I see it, and it's always heading upwards, is that our speed, efficiency, and, and the cost continue to go. Cost continues to go down, speed and efficiency go up by orders of magnitude every five to 10 years. So the reading will increasingly improve. So comparisons. Well, this is just a brief chart that I derived from that Xdance article where they're making a series of extrapolations. You know, red is obviously so-so. DNA, it's kind of slow to read write, so we'll never beat solid state as it stands now, although I think there are routes towards that approach. But you can see on all the number numbers, such as data retention, power usage, and overall data density, we, uh, DNA has potentially huge cost advantages if we can move the technology along adequately. And more importantly, the storage is you know, very, very long, could go on for centuries if needed. So where do things stand in terms of DNA data schemes? Uh, these numbers are a little embarrassing, but it's early days. It's a field in its infancy. So some of the earliest papers reported about 5 megs, 2 megs, 200 megabytes with, uh, 200 megabytes with, a, uh, with a random read features. So there's a steady increase, and I think that this will just continue to shoot up as the area becomes populated by more innovators and new methods that come available. So um, this is new, um, Saki, so don't be surprised by just playing with names in my head. So fortunately, we do have a team at Stanford, multidisciplinary across the School of Medicine, including my department, Department of Biochemistry, Computer Science, Electrical Engineering, and Vaughn Saki, and Mary Wooters, among others, who are trying to build this system, and we've had some early successes. So it's the beginning of our time to get into the foray and hopefully give the people at University of Washington and MIT a good run for their money. So what are the fundamental challenges? Well, the major challenge right now actually is the writing process. Because as good as we are and able to synthesize these DNA sequences and encode information, what's currently being developed still represents materials and technologies that were developed at best about a decade ago. And so a lot of what we're doing now is considering these methods as ways that we compare them, considering their metrics, starting pilot studies where we try to develop data encoding schemes to do that, but then really start to push the envelope and try to consider new approaches. And those are things that we're starting to really bash out um, now and hopefully we'll have systems that will enable us to improve writing significantly. This is probably the most complex part of the challenge. And I think that there will be a lot of innovation that happens, hopefully from us as well as others. DNA encoding, well, I, I took this from one of uh, 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 Saki's uh, graduate students, Mr. Chandek, who is so kind as to provide me with this report, and I've been reading it steadily over the last couple of months, and I'm starting to understand it. So, in which we basically take binary data, arbitrary types, it can be JPEGs, MPEGs, I mean, whatever you want, and then we encode this information into short DNA sequences. These are typically synthesized, and then afterwards, they're placed and considered in terms of context to enable us to eliminate errors, and then we're able to take the same material and subsequently read it back again. And so in more formal terms, what Mr. Chandek did is be able to improve the methodology in terms of encoding. So we're really getting into the details about this. And he particularly, he's come up with something called a binary symmetrical channel in which he can consider noisy reads versus those that have the actual data that's encoded in this. 
So partly through my inspiration working with him and another scientist who's the lead on our technology side, Dr. Billy Lau, we're hopefully taking this and beginning to think of ways to rapidly write this. So we can do DNA addressing, meaning we can have indexing sites where we can essentially address the information. And this represents a paper that Billy developed where he used a generator matrix with certain types of error correction features found in cell phone transmission systems to be able to create gigabyte levels of addresses. So huge, huge numbers. And so this is another part of the technology that we've practically solved. And this is just an example of how it works when you stick it into a sequencer. And you can use this information to be able to extrapolate the identity of the address and determine its uniqueness among all the individual molecules that you're looking at. And then finally, I think the most important advance that we just published is the ability to do random reading. So what we can do now is be able to take this synthetic DNA that's been encoded and subsequently place it into what I call a solid phase support using some kind of chemical moiety, in this case agro speeds, chemically link it onto this, and then subsequently be able to read it once, read it able twice, read it several times, and be able to read specific parts of the data. So I'm rather excited about this because I think this might be one of the first demonstrations where we can do random reading, but still maintain the original DNA molecular substrate which the information was encoded on. So I'm just gonna skip ahead and show you an example of that is what we're doing here is we're using these types of molecular indexes or addresses that are unique to an individual DNA molecule that encodes some part of the information. And then using this type of technology where we can subsequently address the same DNA molecule with its address repeatedly over and over again, we extract out this information and look at the properties of this and be able to derive the information. And so an example here is where we're actually looking at the individual molecules that have been written with some, some information that we had. And what this iteration represents is we go back to the same substrate and the same original molecules and using these highly complex addresses, determine whether that address exists once, repeat the process, does it still exist? Repeat the process, does it still exist? And so the way to interpret this is that this is the number total of molecules that have been addressed as shown on the y-axis, and these are the iterations that we work through, meaning we have our DNA data storage device in a relatively crude form, but then we address it once, we get this amount of information, we address it twice, we get the same amount of information, we address it seven times, and we're still being able to retain the information that we originally queried, and we're querying a specific portion of this genetic code, of this genetic data that's been encoded into the substrate, about 3% that exists here. So we can do this repeatedly. So I think this is an example where one of the major features of a DNA data storage device involving random reading is starting to show itself as being feasible in a practical way. So in conclusion, DNA, storage, uh, DNA data storage, a new technology in its infancy, but one that might represent a solution to the impending data dilemma. Um, we've talked about how DNA data writing, um, reading in particular, we've seen massive advances from the improvements in uh, next generation sequencing technology. Very exciting time. Um, we're working on a new sequencer method right now, and um, you know, it seems like every year we see some significant improvement. And the advent of these solid state systems, such as the ones that use nanopores to read sequences, are particularly exciting. DNA data writing, this is where the work really needs to be done because this represents the major bottleneck. We can't write sufficiently to put terabytes of information on. So my own sense is that we need a change in the paradigm thinking about how this is done. And we have our own solution, and we'll see how harebrained it is or if it ra um, actually works. And I'm kind of hopeful because I'm a, an internal optimist. And then finally, in terms of the Stanford Technology Program, based upon this putative center whose name I just came up with in preparation for this talk, but I hope Saki will be engaged and willing to help me build this, is that in our Stanford Technology Program to develop DNA data storage, We've demonstrated as early milestones that random reading and data addressing in archived data can be done practically in a format that doesn't break the bank. And we'll continue the work um, with all the wonderful students and postdocs who are involved in this team on improving the encoding and the solid state reading, particularly using the next generation of single molecule sequencers. 
So particular contri contributors include Dr. Billy Lau, who is the inventor um, with me of this iterative analysis system for storing information in DNA molecular formats and be able to random read it, as well as the massive gigascale indexing system. Peter Griffin, who's the person and scientist who inspired me to start thinking about this direction and uh, helped me reach conclusions where systems that we have developed are applicable to this problem. And then all, all the students in electrical engineering who've contributed to this as well. And it's been a pleasure and honor to work with them. And then here are members of my group who actually do the work. Um, our funding includes National Science Foundation, for which we're grateful for, and uh, Beckman Award, which uh, Saki was very helpful in, in getting that for us to expand our efforts. So thank you much. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. <laughs>